and sometimes the stuffy room is like, you know, a little bit, a little bit touchy. So, first of all, I want to say thank you to you, Dr. Krugian, for asking me to come to speak tonight. This is the first time experience for me where I am speaking at a university. And it's very interesting because I went for my master's at Fort University, and I was one in the Bronx. Or almost went for it. Then I, I got married. I got married like, um, you know, early 20s. So I didn't complete it. Um, so, and then welcome to all of you. You know, thank you for coming. And I hope that when you leave, you'll have something that you could share with other people that will help the other people, but will help you first, okay? Uh, and then if you have any questions, you know, you could ask me after. And if you all afterwards, you will see, uh, you'll get some information about my address, my phone number. We have the foundation at the house where Joan lived. I'm still at the same house. And uh, you could, you know, you could call me if you wish, or and you're welcome to come to visit. You know, you're welcome to come to visit. We can make the time. So now, what I just want to go into is, you see, Joan, Joan was delivering cookies to my neighbor across the street, and he was a teacher. He was a chemistry teacher at the high school, a high school in one of the like in old, in uh, Tapan, New York, which isn't too far from where we live in Hillsdale, New Jersey. And what happened was, it, it was on Holy Thursday, you would understand this, Holy Thursday was the day that she, it happened. And she went there and she said, you know, I'll be right back. There were the two boxes of cookies in the foyer, we have a, a like a bi-level house, and she never came back. He. He had raped her, and he had murdered her, and he was, I mean, he was like, he took the, it was like the worst thing that could happen to a human being. It was more, it was like, just think of what terrorists do to people, and I mean, this was happening to Joan, even maybe more. And she was just a little innocent, seven and a half year old girl. So how could you ever forget Joan? How could you ever, ever sit in your pain? Because she is alive today. She's alive in a different way. She's alive with her spirit. And she wanted me to be her voice. So now I'm her voice. But also, you see, she was found on Easter Sunday. So I took all this as a message of hope. A message in what I believe in my faith is that there's a hope, there's a message of hope in that. So that was, and I thought of that maybe like about 10 days after Joan died. And I was so thankful that I believed that, and I still believe it, and that brought a lot of hope. So what happened was that because of this historic case, remember this was taking place in 73, okay? In 73. Okay, do I not hold it? Okay. hold this for Okay, yeah. So she, in, in 73, I mean, ch children were going all over the place in the neighborhood. I mean, Joan and her sister could only go four blocks because she had a sister a year older. They could only go four blocks. Others would go into towns. I mean, they were all day, they were out delivering and selling cookies because they wanted to get the prize. So what happened is after Joan, this happened to Joan, rules change in the Girl Scouts. Rules change in Boy Scouts. Rules change in fundraisers. It became historic. And the way parents were like starting to raise their children, they were very, they were even sometimes become paranoid. And I raised four children after Joan died, you know, but I did not believe in being paranoid. 
because you cannot control everything. And you have to let children enjoy being ch children too, but still be watchful. And so society changed. And to this day, I mean, it's 40, 41 years later, her case is as strong as ever, maybe even stronger, because it means so much in society and changes, okay? So now, and remember, there was this hope, this message of hope. Now, what I thought of was that with this message of hope, what could it be? So first 20 years, there was no message that was coming into my heart and my mind. But in 93, when I got the call, very shocking, a shocking call, I'm not expecting it, that Jones Killer would be coming up for parole. And if I didn't, I asked them, do I have to fight this time? He said yes. He says because there's a good chance he'd come out. Because you see, Jones, killer, just got 14 years at that time, which meant life. And in 1993, that was 20 years. So he had spent his, he had, you know, his life. He had spent the time, they said 14, it was like six years over it. So then, I remember, I remember it being very difficult. It was very difficult. And, I remember, you know, like, remember at this time, even in 73, there was no help for victims of crime. I mean, you were on your own. So at that time, my psychiatrist was God. And he still is. So I, I wanted to mention that, cause some of the things that you have to go through. But the first hour, I just remember just sobbing. Just, oh, I was crying. And then I said, okay, that's enough. Now I gotta get to work. So what do you think I did? What do you think I did? We started the movement. We had a vigil. 1,500 people came. We had a petition drive. We had a green ribbon drive. Green because Jones' favorite color is green. Green became a symbol, a motto, a green ribbon. Remember Joan today so tomorrow's children will be safe. And we had a petition drive, a letter drive. And with all that, and then the media came in. I, I started to connect with the media. And you have to remember, I had no idea of any of this. I remember the first, at the vigil, the first time I really spoke, you know, to a large crowd. So what was happening was, which might happen in your lives as you, when you have to deal with something very hard. Certain things come out of you that you had that you didn't know you had. And you use those, those wonderful gifts that you didn't know you had. So out of everything that's negative, no matter what you have in your life, there's always something good that could come out of it. Just think about that. You know, even you know, even if you're feeling emotional and all, you still you still have your mind to think, and that's what happens, and that's what happened to me, and that's the way I look at it to this day, right, John? Yeah. Right? You know, like say, no, I'm not not to be that it's not easy. Things are hard. Not to act like you know you're self righteous or something, but. Just think about it, even inside you, and that can make you feel more peaceful. So then what happened was there were there were so many appeals because with the fight we put up, he did not come out. Okay? But he appealed, he had monies, and that's what made me go for the Justice Victims Law because the statute of limitation in New Jersey was only two years. Now the Justice Victims Law, the statute of limitations in New Jersey is, there's no more statute. Even a case from 50 years ago, a victim can sue the criminal. 
if you see he's writing a book or has some money, payments of money, you know, if you found out about it, that money goes to the victim and that victim could use it maybe for their foundation or for their family that needs help. So that's, that's what happened. Now, in, um, in that time with the appeals, there was a lot of testifying. We testified, I testified in, let's see, that was 93 and 98 and 2008. And to testify means that you have to relive everything or else you're not going to be able to explain the information, what you went through to the parole board chairperson and the parole board people. So you really have to be, you know, very, very into it. And that's very, very, very difficult, very difficult. But uh, John and Michael did the last time. And, and I, you know, I saw the pain that they were going through and they were understanding that, wow, this is tough, this is tough. Because remember, they, they never met Joan. So they were, they, their journey was different, you see. And, and, and also, like, um, you know, affected in many different ways. So what happened was, is it was time for change. This is very important. And there, see you go with that? That's one of the things I started with, with Jones Law. In fact, that was the first flyer. It was time, because in 94, that's when I started with the law we start the movement. And you see, what the law does, there would be no appeals. And there would not, not be, families wouldn't have to testify. And it could even eliminate maybe a perpetrator, you know, murdering a child because they'll know about this law and they won't want to die in prison. Because this is what you do, you will die in prison with this law. So this law is as much justice as you can get like on this earth as much justice without having hatred, without having, because I don't have that. Without, but you see the way I do it. I do it this way. Not, not having this, uh, like being so bitter, because then with that, all the good that you have to be taken away. And I would not let that happen to me. I would not be a victim. I would not let, let, the, let anybody that is so, 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 so evil, you know, ever, ever take who I am away. When, so therefore, I could be her voice. Therefore, I could do what I'm doing now. Therefore, I could enjoy the things I enjoy, you know? But to not have it, that's, that's you know, I could explain to you how I did it sometime. It's, it's something, I'm very lucky to have my faith. I'm very lucky you know, a lot of things. So now, um, the first law was Jones Law, and that came in 97. And then we had other laws, which John, we had, John will explain after. There were um, two more laws in New York, in New York State, in your state. And, um, and then we had one on the federal level. And I tell you the truth, the New York State one was hard to get through because uh, this was, and this was the first mandatory life, life a mandatory sentencing law in, in ever in New York State in the St. Jones Law. So we, we had the foundation, we started the foundation, that's where we help the children, the vulnerable children, learn about, you know, good things, have fun, go on excursions, learn about careers with working dogs. And then these, these children get to understand about something positive in life and hopefully they will not go into the negative. Because that's one of the things that's very important I think to do is always, always be aware of helping people see, and children especially, seeing that, you know, you care for them. And this way they won't have so much anger in them. 
and violence won't be something that maybe they'll, they'll want to get close to. So that'll make it a safer society. Now, um, you wonder why the White Butterfly Song before, and the White Butterfly Song was written, someone, a musician, wrote it, and that was for Joan. And why the White Butterfly? Because when I went to the site where Joan was found, and that was in Harriman State Park, and that park, that's in the mountains. And what happened was, is I hadn't gone there for eight years the second time I went. Of course, for eight years I had been sick with myasthenia. But still, I was doing things from bed or when I had the energy. And uh, what happened was, is I'm going, I'm coming up the mountain because Joan's body was put almost like in a sepulcher type rock. Two rocks with an opening, almost looking like a sepulcher opening is in a you know in a boulder and uh, behind the boulder on an April day it was cloudy there was this little bit white thing <coughs> and I thought I thought it was a like a moth because I never knew there were white butterflies I don't know they, and they called them more cabbage whites white butterflies and and there was this white butterfly and I go oh my gosh look at that She's so happy that I'm here and that I'm feeling better and that I can do I can do the work, I do the mission. And and be her voice. And that's how the white butterfly became, you know, that's how it became known. So that's why we have now a white butterfly sculpture and garden. And uh, that was just um, started 2013, just finished this year. And the reason why I started that in the movement was because the 40th anniversary was in 2013. So now we have a sculpture and garden, and it's right there at the train station in Hillsdale, right in the front of it. And it's really, it's all about child safety. The big picture is child safety, child safety awareness. And you will see, uh, John will show you the words on it after that are on it and you'll see the white butterfly carved in it, and you'll see this beautiful garden. And it was, you know, done by many, and the foundation, you know, is responsible for it. Like, you know, all the, um, all the, all the money involved in it. And then, um, this, this white butterfly over here, right? This past Holy Thursday, this was in my garden. <laughs> This white butterfly, what do you think of that? Remember, she was, she died on Holy Thursday. And this is the year the sculpture and garden was celebrated. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of signs, a lot of messages. You know, you need to look at them and listen to them. But isn't that amazing? I'm coming down the front steps, and there it was. And then John took a picture. And that was not holy place. Then, at the place, at the site, at the site where Joan was found, on last year in 2013, it was it was not easy to get a sculpture and garden. You had to deal with you had to deal with the politicians. You had to deal. You had to deal with the town. You had to deal with the people. A lot, a lot of people didn't want it. They didn't want it. They didn't want it. They wanted to kind of just hide. Uh, they wanted their town not to like to hide. Let's hide Joan. Let's not think of that. Let's not bring that up because that's not a good subject. We don't want awareness about sexual assault awareness in our town. We don't want our town to be remembered like that. They were very concerned about their image. So you had, I had to work with that. But in working with that, we had to work with, um, you know, what I found is that you listen to the people, I listen, right? And then, then I respond. And then if 
if I need to respond like real strong, like firm, but I, I never will try to, and it's, it's not easy sometimes, but sometimes oh, you really feel like pulling the hair. But I found out if you respect the people, I res respect the people, respect their opinion, and, and then definitely I respect myself. But it's like a respect situation, even though you don't agree, even though you're thinking that way, even though you're judging me, and so forth, okay? And, and I think Joan would have had that way a lot too, because I saw it in her seven years. So, it, you know, it worked, it worked. And you're going for something that's, you know, beyond you, you know, it's like a bigger, a bigger picture. So over here, over here, someone went and took a pic, they would take pictures at the site. They look at your photo, they're, they're looking at the picture, and this was on it. And right here is where Joan's head was. And her head was up, like, you know, looking at, at towards the sky. And look what was over it. Look what was coming here. And that's what was in the picture. So I like to think of this as Joan showing us what she looks like on this earth. And she gave this, this was on someone's photo. Now a white butterfly. There was just a book now that's going to be a Caldecott Award winner, probably. Um, draw, it's called Draw, it's a children's book. And the illustrator that did it, and who did the whole book, dedicated to, it says, dedicated to Joan, a white butterfly in the sky. A white butterfly. So there's a lot of people get very inspired by her story, by her spirit. And um, I just want to tell you that, you know, in order for things to change, you need to bring it out in the open. Don't be afraid. And because I see it in my neighborhood, new neighbors, when they found out that it was me that was across the street, they went, oh, like that. And, and I knew I'd never get their address anymore. They wouldn't, they wouldn't bother with me anymore because it happened so many times. Even with the older neighbors when I started doing this work. But the thing is, don't let that stop you because in bringing out something that's so important for social justice in society, you need to bring awareness, you need to be open, and you need to be involved. So I would say to you, and leave you now, with, I want you to do some thinking, and in your life, from this day, right now, what, what would you do to make society better to get involved in social justice and how would you get involved or what would you do? And that's what I leave you with because you could make a big difference and all of us together, that's how we make society better because there is hope in society and there is good in society and just show it keep on showing me, and then we'll have a strong society. And thank you. Thank you. Can you speak, John? Yeah. Um, can you pass these out?
Hi, um, I'm John. Uh, uh, John Del Sandro. I'm the um, youngest um, brother of Joan. I was born after uh, she was murdered. And I just wanted to, uh, oh, first of all, thank you again for having us. Uh, I just want to go over um, the handing out packets to you, each of you. Right now, I just wanted to go through the packet to tell you what you had. Right over here, I'm just playing some pictures from uh, our recent events. Uh, so first of all, you got the little white butterfly. And uh, my mom just uh, told me the significance of the white butterfly. Then you have the green ribbon, which is uh, said, remember Joan today. So tomorrow's children will be saved. That was Joan's favorite color. And uh, my mom started that campaign to keep um, Joan's killer in prison. So part of that was handing out green ribbons. Then you have a picture of Joan, her Girl Scout picture. And that became like a famous picture throughout the campaign. Then we have our information card on the back. It says some of the foundation's accomplishments. Then you have a picture of each of the, the different phases of the Joan D'Alessandro by Butterfly Sculpture Garden. And um, you see that we just added lights in October. In September. And then, uh, then you have the wording on the back of the sculpture.